Welcome to Tuesday Topics. I'm Vicki Arnett, President of the Topeka League. Uh, just a couple of Zoom reminders because we have a lot of participants today. Please keep your microphone on mute throughout the Chief's remarks um, and place any questions that you have in the chat box. Uh, several of us will be monitoring the chat box and we'll give those questions to the Chief uh, as we go along. Uh, I want to remind um, uh, League members that the League of Women Voters uh, of Kansas is currently reviewing the state league position on criminal justice. Uh, if you have not already done so, I encourage you to review our current position, which is posted on the state league's website. It's linked through our current voter and on their website. Uh, please use the presentation today to inform yourself about the issues of criminal justice reform in order to prepare for voting on the revised position statement in early 2021. At this point, I'm going to turn the program over to Dennis Bosley, our board member, uh, who will introduce the chief because they've had a long-standing relationship. So, Dennis? Chief Bill Cochran was appointed the Chief of Police for the City of Topeka in January of 2018. He's been with the Topeka Police Department since 1987 and served in every bureau of the agency. He's a graduate of Northwestern University Center for Public Safety Police Staff and Command School, the Police Executive Research Forum Senior Management Institute for Police, and has a master's degree in business administration from Friends University. He graduated from Washburn University with a bachelor in criminal justice and minors in history, political science, and sociology. Chief Cochran is very active in the Topeka community and serves on several boards. They include the court appointed special advocate, CASA, the Tower Foundation through the Kansas Attorney General's office, Employer Support of the Guard and Reserve, United Way of Greater Topeka, and the Washburn University Criminal Justice Advisory Board. Chief Cochran retired from the Kansas Army National Guard in 2005 after a 13-month combat tour in Iraq. Chief Cochran was awarded the Joint Commendation Service Medal with Valor for Actions in Combat and the Combat Action Badge. Chief Cochran has been married for 32 years to Kelly, and they have three daughters, Casey, who is a high school science teacher, Corey, who is an emergency room nurse, and Caitlin, who graduated from the Topeka Police Department's Basic Police Academy on October the 29th, 2019, and is now a police officer in the city of Topeka. I might, might want to mention, I first met Chief Cochran on April the 18th, 2008, in the Sunflower Room of the VA, Building 5. Uh, that was during Topeka's first crisis intervention team training. And that was back when he was a sergeant. Uh, since then, he has carried the ball wonderfully. And it has become one of the signature programs of the Topeka Police Department. So I give you Chief Cochran. Thank you. Well, I've uh, been married 33 years now since that. <laughs> Had our first grandchild three days ago or so. So, yeah. So, uh, yeah. Well, I guess the uh, topic today or uh, the inquiry today was defunding police, what that looks like, conversation about, and stuff like that. What I can tell you in the city of Topeka, there's been absolutely zero talk about defunding the police. That's not been a a conversation topic. Um, I know that some of you probably have heard some of that, some of that talk, uh, some of that rhetoric, but you know, there is no uh, conversation of that. Uh, City of Topeka, as well as the governing body and everything is very supportive of uh, first responders and, and all that. So when, you know, you look across the country and we talk about defunding the police, uh, a lot of things that I think you have to take in consideration when you look at a lot um, they've been forming a lot of functions that are really not police-related functions. 
And as a result, in order to do that, dollars have been put into those budgets to fund those type of programs. And so the question becomes is, you know, is it really defunding the police? Or as a lot of people, other people say reallocation of funds. Is it putting it over here in another uh, agency or whatever to take up those, those roles? And so the question becomes when we talk about those type of things is at two or three o'clock in the morning when you need a caseworker or a social worker or whatever, are they going to be available? And so out through the history time and stuff like that, law enforcement has picked up those roles because we're out there 24 seven. And so then the question is during those roles, how do we make, but resources and all that to be able to provide the proper services to individuals who are in need of those services. And, you know, Dennis mentioned our CIT program, Crisis Intervention. That's a prime example. When you deal with individuals who are on a in a behavioral health crisis, we don't dictate the time, place, or manner in which those situations occur. And when people get in, into a uh, um, manic state to where Family members feel there's nobody else to call or nobody, uh, no other resources. And so that's when police departments get called. And so it's very important that we have individuals that are trained adequately in how to deal with individuals who are in different types of behavioral health crises. Uh, not saying we're experts in it, but, you know, the basics and the aspect of how do you work to uh, decriminalize mental illness and defer somebody to behavioral health services, which would be the ultimate goal. And so when you talk about dollars is, okay, if we don't want law enforcement to respond to that call, then we have to have people that are going to respond to that call. And who do they work for? Where do they come from? And then, you know, um, how do you set up? Are they going to be out there 24 hours a day? And so one of the things that we're really uh, pleased with with our CIT program is we have a partnership with Vallejo. And... Right now, many of you may or may not know, Vallejo's in some budgetary issues. And so one of the things that uh, I did so we can make a commitment to the citizens of Topeka is in our I requested an additional $100,000 uh, for behavior health services. And so uh, the primary reason for that is so we have somebody uh, that can work with the police department that's out there on uh, evenings and night shift. We currently have a partnership with the county, Vallejo, and the city of Topeka to pay for a crisis responder that works directly with the police department during the day. Um, and then we had a grant from KDAS that paid for the uh, second shift and then third shift was something that Vallejo felt, hey, was necessary to do. But with budget uh, issues, you know, that position has been eliminated. So my goal or my point was, and, and it got approved, was we put the extra dollars into uh, the behavior health fund. And so we can enter into a contract where uh, we would pay the crisis responders salaries 100%. So that means they'd be dedicated to law enforcement in Shawnee County 100% of the time. Uh, currently, you know, with uh, Vallejo paying part of the salaries or whatever, they can pull them back and use them for different things uh, on a limited basis. But what this would allow us to do is be able to have dedicated people working directly with the police department and uh, answering those those calls. And so, you know, those things, the dynamics when you talk about, you know, is that uh, defunding, reallocating, or whatever. But uh, that's one of the programs. Another one of the programs across the nation that um, is, you know, homeless outreach efforts. In some of your larger cities, some of those places like Oakland and Los Angeles and uh, Seattle and places like that where you have a large population, a lot of those services and stuff are provided through the police department because of safety reasons or whatever. And so, you know, we talk about reallocation or defunding the funds there. Those are some of the programs that they're talking about. The question, and you know, who's going to provide some of those services if, you know, law enforcement is not. And I'm not saying that law enforcement has to do it. I'm just saying those are things that have to be really taken into consideration. When we deal with like domestic violence and sometimes with the homeless situation and the unsheltered population, some of those situations become very unstable because of the dynamics of what's going on 
in that situation. And so a lot of times law enforcement's gonna be called to those anyhow. And so when you deal with it, like, you know, domestic violence, for example, um, you know, some places are, are having social workers respond to those calls. Well, that's, you know, in concept, I think that's a great idea, but I don't know if that's the proper response, you know, to a domestic call because domestic calls are so unstable. Uh, some people think that the domestic call becomes unstable when law enforcement shows up. But I can tell you my experience is that that's not, not the case that I've seen. But if it's one of those things that if we had, you know, uh, like, like I said, with the crisis be utilized in that capacity too, because when you think about it, a domestic call, Somebody is probably in not the right state of mind, would you say? And I think you would agree. And so that's where those case managers can also be utilized that in our particular situation. And so um, also when you talk with dealing with the unsheltered population, um, some of those suffer from mental illness, other they have uh, substance abuse issues or what have you. And so you have that dynamic that is also built in. And so those are some of the things that you have to talk about. So, you know, like I said, in Topeka, there's no been, been no talk of uh, uh, defunding the police department. And, you know, one of the questions, you know, one of the topics that came up the other day was, you know, in essence, the police department's budget has been increased by like $5 million over the last seven years. Well, when you, when you look at that, most of that is because of personnel. About 89% of our budget now is personnel costs sworn and unsworn. And so, yes, the budget technically has gone up, but that's because of personnel costs. But discretionary funds, ones that we can use to do other things, have been decreased. Um, a prime example is we cut 1.4 million out of, out of the budget um, for 20. Um, and our budget still went up slightly because of personnel costs but we lost discretionary fund. And out of those discretionary funds are really not really discretionary in the aspect that that's where you purchase, you know, your electricity and rent or what other expenses that you have. And so when you talk about dollars that can actually be used for discretionary things has really been diminished. But with that being said, it's to uh, defund the police, if that makes sense. So I don't know, maybe that in a nutshell, provided a little information about it. And, and uh, I think maybe we can roll into questions if that works for everybody else. So Chief Cochran, um, uh, I might ask you while we're um, getting questions into the uh, chat box here that um, I, uh, I watched part of the um, the forum um, last week uh, at the city council meeting, and there seemed to be uh, controversy around some specific issues around the uh, the movement by the city to make a part of the municipal code um, uh, rather than police policy. Um, uh, a ban on chokeholds and a ban on no-knock warrants. Um, so can you speak to that? Yeah, definitely. Um, so let's start with the no-knock warrant since they did pass an ordinance on that. Um, one of the things that uh, we've not used, uh, we've not used no-knock warrants for, for a long time uh, because they're extremely dangerous to everybody involved, not just uh, the resident that you're going into, but it's also dangerous to law enforcement too. Because the thing is when people are caught by surprise or off guard or in the middle of the night, that's when, you know, and, you know, you don't know what's going on or whatever. Uh, and, and so those, when those situations become uh, very dangerous. So we have not done no knock warrants for quite some time. And also the other thing is um, when you go to the judge to get a warrant signed, you know, they are very reluctant 
to, to grant a no-knock warrant because of the danger to everybody involved. And so when that came up, that was one of those things, I was not opposed to an ordinance, you know, banning no-knock warrants. And what the warrant, what the ordinance does, as one council member said, our policy is we don't do them, but I'm not gonna be the chief forever. And when you get a new chief in, he or she may have a different perspective. And they may say, hey, we need to do no-knock warrants for whatever reason. By putting it in ordinance, you're basically codifying it in the aspect that we're not going to do them going forward, even if there's a new chief that comes in, okay? And it upset a lot of people. I don't know, um, you know, really why that's so upsetting because we, we have really limited the way we, we serve warrants. Um, we try not to do them at night unless there's extreme circumstances. Uh, you know, if there's children children in the home, we don't do those type of warrants unless, again, it's something that somebody's life is at danger. Um, and so, you know, we you know, don't do them next to schools when schools are in session. So we have a lot of those precautions, and those are just things that, to me, is sound business. You know, we want to keep everybody safe. We Yes, bad guys need to go to jail, but we also got a way – uh, what that does to everybody around and keeping everybody safe. The next one is, is the chokehold. Again, we have it in our policy that um, you cannot, you know, use a chokehold unless it's in self-defense, you know, um, uh, to protect yourself. And so, again, that's one of those conversations that, um, again, centers around, uh, I'm not going to be here, so if another chief comes in and says, hey, I'm gonna authorize these, again, that, that's what that um, ordinance would have done. So when you codify it into ordinance, you're basically put it in, in, in a form that um, takes work to revert it back, if that makes sense. And so, you know, self in a self, lawful self-defense situation, again, to me, I don't know, um, again, everybody has different opinions. But my personal opinion is I think that, you know, we don't, you, we don't do them now, not planning to use them. And so if it was become an ordinance, I don't know if it's a big issue. But on the other side of that, there are really that don't make good law. And not all good laws make good policy. And that's why you have a difference between policy and, and law. And I think that's very um, important to know, realize, and understand, because with a policy, you change and adapt as things go along. If you have an ordinance, you can't do that, because if something changes, then you got to go to the city council, they got to vote on it, then it's got to be posted, and it's got to be posted for several weeks, and then they can vote on it, and then it can be enacted, so you put a lot of space and timing in there that could be detrimental to um, everybody. And so, I've yet to hear of an agency um, get sued because they have bad law. Agency, because that's a city thing. Agencies get sued because they have poor policy. And that's why it's important that policy is kept up to date, reviewed, and uh, monitored all the time. So we have another question um, about, could you tell us a little bit more about what community policing really means in Topeka? Well, I think we have a very strong community policing uh, um, effort that goes on. Community policing is much more than just going out. Okay? Community policing is actually being involved in the community, uh, doing programs such as this, having uh, officers and commanders serve on different boards and committees throughout the, the city and the county. Uh, because what that does is that allows people to have direct access uh, to police officers and law enforcement in which they can have uh, conversations, and uh, they also get to see things in a different light. And so community policing, like I said, is much more than just doing picnics and that stuff. All that's important, uh, but also establishing that trust between uh, community members and uh, things like that. But, you know, that's a two-way street. You, you know, we have to be able to have individuals in community that if we want to, uh, they want to be involved, they want to try to help move things forward in a positive manner, then, you know, they also have to 
have a that that mutual respect in the aspect that uh, they use things in a positive manner to try to help the city of Topeka and the citizenry and not push personal agendas. So it becomes very important in the aspect that it is 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 a an encompassing um, not just going to picnics but being involved you know from top to bottom in the community and going to different community events and different programs. And by events, you know, I'm talking the city address and stuff like that, to where there's a lot of different individuals throughout the community that go to them. And, uh, uh, you know, so when you talk about community policing, it's, it's a holistic approach, not just one, one aspect. And, and the hopes are that every police officer also embraces that, that even though they may not be a designated community officer, but they are a community officer in the aspect that uh, they're part of the concept and the team. Um, so we have a question about, can you speak to some of your ideas around building collaboration with community organizations and um, other experts outside of law enforcement who specialize in working to intervene in crisis scenarios? Um, yeah, I, one of the things, we work pretty closely with the uh, uh, Center for Peace and Justice and uh, a lot of ideas that come out of that and how do we work together? How do we, uh, re we're working on an endeavor together right now, how do you reduce gun violence uh, in our communities? Uh, that's one, another is uh, the Center for Empowerment and Safety. We work closely with them. How do we improve the quality of life of those individuals that uh, may be the victim uh, of domestic violence um, and family violence and how do you improve those? Um, well, the really big ones that we get involved in I think one of the biggest things, you know, when you talk about community policing, that's what I'm trying to say in the aspect that having people involved in stuff that is not, shall we say, police related or law enforcement related, because what that also does is that gives us a better understanding of what those individuals uh, may be encountering and going through. And so um, that helps us when it comes to planning and putting things together and training that we get those aspects of things as well. And so um, you know, we're involved a lot with the Topeka Rescue Mission. Um, Sergeant Clam, our Behavior Health Unit, super works closely with a lot of different partners, you know, Family Service Guidance Center, Vallejo, uh, Stormont Vale, Topeka Rescue Mission, and, um, you know, there's others in there. But those are all entities that are not directly law enforcement related things, but yet very important to us because we have to deal with them on a daily basis in the aspect of, you know, behavioral health issues or the unsheltered population. And so if you have those partnerships that are established where you can work together, um, then you can get a lot of things accomplished. You can keep a lot of people out of the criminal justice system and, uh, and forge some great partnerships. So we have another question about, um, and I think this this kind of speaks to what is the process, but um, who defends an officer who's been charged with a violation of the law in his or her capacity as a law enforcement officer? Maybe you could speak to um, the, the entire process when an officer has been charged with excessive use of force. Um, what's what's the process now, and uh, what is the city council proposing uh, our options to deal with that issue moving forward? Well, there's two avenues, and so you have to separate them out. One is um, it, okay, not misconduct, but a criminal charge, whatever that might be. Then the normal process is if there is a potential for a criminal charge, then most of the time uh, the officer is placed on administrative leave pending the investigation. And then there's two types of investigations that take place. One is an internal policy violation relating to that criminal charge. Then the other investigation is a criminal investigation case. If there's a case where there's criminal misconduct and um, uh, alleged and there's potential that criminal charges can be filed, we then contact a outside agency and on criminal times that is the Kansas Bureau investigation and ask them to conduct the criminal investigation. 
that way it's taken out of our hands in the aspect that we're not investigating our own. And so um, they go through that process and then they send the case to the DA's office. Then the DA's office makes a determination on whether there's gonna be criminal charges filed. The administrative process would also mirror the other, when I said there's an administrative and a criminal, the administrative process is um, if, if, there's, if there's a criminal charges, the administrative process, a lot of things are worked up until the point to where uh, it doesn't, where it needs to stop because it's gonna interfere with the criminal case. Then when the criminal case is disposed of, then the internal investigations pick back up to follow through with those. If it's a peer uh, you know, uh, complaint or something like that of misconduct, uh, depending on the level of that uh, misconduct, it can either be referred to the bureau in which the officer works, like field operations, criminal investigations, or um, community outreach bureau to conduct the follow-up investigation to see if there's any policy violations or anything like that. Or it can be conducted by the uh, Professional Standards Unit, PSU, which used to be known, many some may internal affairs, but the, the new terminology is Professional Standards Unit. Then investigation and the interviews and all that stuff like that. Who defends them and protects them is kind of, you know, uh, depending on what type of investigation it is. Of course, if it's a criminal charge, they're probably going to have an attorney involved. Um, and they do that on, on their own, you know, they get those on their own. Um, then if it's, um, of course the, the union, then it provides them with, um, you know, counseling and protection and stuff like that. Um, so that's kind of where that's at. Uh, what, as far as the city council, we have the individual or independent police auditor. Uh, that was a position, you know, that I advocated for back when uh, I was going through the process of the chief. Uh, that was a position that was hired less than a year ago. So we're still um, working through some of those things, but the independent police auditor has access to everything that we have internally at the police department, works directly for the city attorney and not the police department. So um, a normal process is that if somebody wants to file a complaint or whatever, they can talk to an independent police auditor um, and they're involved in it that way. Uh, use of force, for example, that goes through the internal process. Then once it's done with the internal process, then the independent auditor reviews that um, for an outside set of eyes and uh, then has conversation with the city manager. Um, so there's a lot of conversation right now for a citizen's review board. Um, <clears throat> there's you know, a lot of people in favor of that, a lot of people that are opposed to that. And so you know, that's conversation that is ongoing, I know. Um, but, um, you know, I, I think the city would like to stay with the, uh, the idea of the independent police auditor, but like I said, there's a lot of conversation about that. Um, the next question we have is regarding cultural and racial sensitivity training, um, on, at, do, do police management and the police union collaborate in preparation and delivery of the training? Or tell us a little bit more about the um, uh, bias sensitivity training that the police department has. Yeah, uh, bias-based bias policing um, training of some type is required by the state of Kansas um, for all law enforcement officers. So we do uh, the state mandate every year now, the state doesn't tell you what that bias-based police training has to be. It just has to be something that um, is on that topic, okay? And so then the other thing that we do, one of the things that I felt was important, again, when um, going through the chief's process was, you know, um, community uh, collaboration. And I feel it's very important that our officers understand the people in which they police. And so to me, I, I'm very high on culture competency training to where you, we learn those aspects, understand those aspect, uh, understand those things. Uh, because when we talk about, um, you know, different races, cultures or whatever, uh, everybody's raised differently. Everybody thinks differently. Everybody has 
different opinions on, on what things look like and how they ought to be and, and how they should be done. And so that's why I think it's extremely important that um, we do a lot of focusing on culture competency training. Um, so uh, other, we, we also do um, racial profile training is kind of rolled into the base, bias basing uh, policing training. Uh, but those are things that we, we do a lot uh, in the basic academy, uh, getting, you know, people to understand and, and talk to, uh, you know, everybody has personal biases. And it's a matter of what you do with those personal biases, how you apply those or whatever. And how does that influence you and your thought processes? We spend time on, you know, bias-based police and culture competency and all those type of things. They get a lot of that training. And when I talk about in-service, that's uh, the state of Kansas mandates that we have 40 hours of continuing education training every year. And that's what I refer to when I talk about in-service training. So some of those 40 hours are spent on that, that uh, type of training. In the academy, the basic academy, they get a lot more of those hours. And so, yeah, there is conversation um, with FOP members and training staff and, and things like that as to uh, the formulation of what the training looks like and how it's gonna be presented. Uh, one of the big things that we started a little over a year ago is a lot more scenario-based training um, with those type of uh, uh, situations, so. Um. So back to the community collaborations with different um, social service agencies. Um, what's what, in your opinion, is working well with those collaborations, and what uh, what needs to improve? Well, for me, I think um, a collaboration that's working really well is the uh, collaboration that we have with Vallejo, as far as um, behavior health services. I think what needs to improve is we need a more uh, robust effort. Um, you know, I talked about, you know, the extra funding and having a person on all three shifts. Uh, but realistically, there's some of the, the weekends and sometimes during the day where um, we need more than one uh, crisis responder in the field. And so, you know, that's a great partnership. It's working very well, but is that something that um, could use some improvement? I think that would really be one of them there. Um, I think probably one of the other ones that uh, relationship that is working very well, but we could stand to improve on that uh, is really with the Center for Empowerment and Safety. And as far as the conversation, we've done a lot of work on human trafficking and stuff like that. But I think at the local level, sometimes we still miss the boat um, on identifying human trafficking and what that looks like and how we can uh, intervene to, to help victims. And so I think that's probably uh, one of the collaborations that works very well, but could use some improvement. Um, but I think really one of the biggest uh, efforts that I would, I would like to get going and, and you know, um, um, spend some time in, you know, the state of Kansas Department of Correction has a reentry program for when people come out of prison. But I think one of the things that we as a society um, set people up coming out of institutions for failure. Because, you know, when I was in Iraq for 15 months, when I came back, things changed a lot. I can only, and I still had freedoms. I can only imagine if you've been incarcerated for 5, 10, 15, 20 years where you've not had freedom, and then we say, okay, time for you to go back home. And then because of the volume and, and stuff, you know, Department of Corrections, they send you home and, and then they say, okay, we need you to come to this location in 15 days to meet with your parole officer without taking in really how are they going to get there? What do they do for the 15 days that they're out? <laughs> you know, so we really find, need to find 
support systems, mechanisms, um, and safety net for individuals coming out of prison. And I know there's a lot of groups, some, some in, in Topeka and other places where church groups or whatever, if they have family members that have somebody getting out of prison or, or an institution, you know, they work on that, um, provide those services. But, you know, when, we, when you think about it, um, that's got to be pretty daunting and, and intimidating that you're coming out, released back to a community. When, when you think of technology changes, you know, just in five years, can imagine 15 or whatever. I mean, everybody in our world now has a cell phone. If they don't, you know, don't have one of these and, you know, we're almost dysfunctional, shall you say. Uh, so imagine trying to get integrated into that. Um, and so I think that's a collaboration that um, needs work. And, um, you know, I had some often on conversations, but, you know, it's one of those things that's going to take, it, it really takes the community on that one because not one entity, you know, the state of Kansas Department of Correction, they can do what they can do, you know, police department, we can do what we can do, but we really got to have those, um, those community partnerships and, and uh, things in the community that are there. And then, and then the other thing is, um, and, and I know some of you may be employers yourself, but one of the things it's, it's very hard for employers to grasp hiring a convicted felon. But, you know, when we talk about, um, you know, restorative justice and stuff like that, you know, if you've gone, you've done your time, and it is, I know it's a gamble sometimes, but those individuals need jobs. And so how do we find jobs for them in job markets and places where um, people are willing to hire them, hire them and give them that chance? And so that's kind of that network system we need to look at. You know, and there's there certain jobs out there that they may want to do, but you just can't because of your, your history or your background, but there's a lot of other jobs that you can do. And so it's kind of finding that mix and, and how do we um, incorporate them back into society to where they're productive citizens? Because if they come back and they reoffend and they go back to prison, you know, it's expensive. We, we're costing ourselves you know, the hopes are that when they come out, they paid their, they paid their due to society, whatever that may be. And then, okay, you may have done that, but now we need help make you be successful. And how do we reintegrate you back in? You're muted. Here we go. Sorry. Uh, building on the national focus on no-knock warrants. Um, what are other procedures the department uses that could be ordinances or uh, instead of just being policy or best practices? Um, or what kind of ordinance changes do you feel like needs to need to occur in Topeka? Well, um, personally, I'm not a, uh, a person that's a huge advocate for pol uh, policy becoming ordinances. Um, I think what we have to do is we have to look at the state level and the state level needs, they need to make a decision on law enforcement is going to do this or not going to do that. And so they really need to come uh, from our state legislatures, uh, legislators in the aspect of what makes good law uh, as opposed to that. Ordinances are really difficult in the aspect that um, if it's, if it's a state law, then the district attorney would be the one that would be uh, responsible for prosecution. If it's a city ordinance, then you have your city prosecutor, which is a city entity, which is city court, and it really becomes very um, uh, discombobulated and not really a separation of powers, shall we say. And so when you look at things, you know, what it, What's police reform look like? Where does it need to come from? It really needs to be driven a lot from the state level uh, with input from municipalities uh, as opposed to a lot of these things becoming city ordinances. Um, and so this is a, another question that kind of speaks to that um, levels of uh, government, I think, kind of issue. Um, 
because the, the county sheriff's department is a different law enforcement agency in Shawnee County. Um, so is the sheriff in agreement with uh, such things as no knock warrant and uh, no toe hold policy? Yeah, the, the Shawnee County Sheriff's Office, like any sheriff's office in, 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 the, in the state of Kansas is an elected position and it is a separate entity from the police department. Uh, the only exception to that is Raleigh County. Raleigh County has a uh, Raleigh County Police Department that consolidated uh, the Sheriff's Office and Police Department years ago under a uh, um, law enforcement board, okay? And so they don't have an elected official like our sheriff is. And I, and I can't speak to um, Sheriff Hill's position on, on these things. We have a lot of conversation and some things that, you know, we're in agreement with and some things we're not. Uh, mainly because uh, they're a different ent entity and th even though they're a law enforcement agency, they have different missions. Um, they're responsible for uh, all your uh, warrant services, um, uh, uh, civil uh, litigation, you know, eviction notices, uh, uh, child support, and uh, warrants and all that other stuff. So. They have some different missions, and so uh, you know they have different opinions on certain types of things because of what they're doing and how they interact with the public. So um, most of the things, you know, we have, like I said, we have conversation quite often. We meet quite often and and uh, discuss. And you know, there are some things that we see that we have the same vision on, and then there's others that that they don't. Um, but I can't really speak to his his agency and his personal uh, view on, on some of these things. Um, so, you know, as you well know, the discussion nationwide is about um, systemic racism within law enforcement. So how do you respond to that issue or question in Topeka? Well, I think the biggest thing is that it's, um, if you want to talk about systemic racism, uh, racism and systemic problems, it's it's a holistic thing. It's not just, uh, you know, one of people want to say it's law enforcement. Well, right now law enforcement is what's under the eye because of things that are going on. Um, but I think if you look at it, it's across the board. If you want to be realistic about things, you know, um, and, and right now, uh, law enforcement is the, the part of government that is under scrutiny, uh, for events that have happened recently. Uh, but when you look at the the whole system, that you know it's it's not just law enforcement. And so, when you talk about systemic things within particular agencies or places like that, um, you know, we we if I'm not a you know I'm not a minority, and so I can't speak to certain feelings and stuff uh, that individuals feel. And just like, you know, females, I cannot speak to how you feel and things like that. But what's important that we have to understand is if somebody has an issue and it is an issue for them, we have to be understanding of that. And then we have to figure out how we're going to work through that situation. And so I think, um, you know, I think as long as you have human beings, you're going to have racism. That's, I think that's just part of life, you know. Um, and it's been around for many years, and I'm just not just talking about, um, you know, um, you know, uh, color of skin racism. We have religious persecution. We have a religious uh, racism. We have, um, you know, a variety of different things and uh, as far as racism. So when we talk about systemic issues, I think the, the heart of it is, is we have to, as leaders and people involved in making decisions, we have to really understand what, and I think this is where things get pushed over, or have been pushed over in the past. People in, per, in positions of authority really think, okay, well, that's really not that big a deal. Well, wh why is that an issue? And those things have been pushed to the side or whatever. And 
I think what we have to do as leaders nowadays is take and understand that when somebody has an issue, we have to listen to that issue and then say, okay, what can we do to improve that issue? And to me, that's how you really start to eliminate some of the systemic things is you have to understand other people's positions. And that's one of the things that you know I tell people right now is freedom of speech is one of those things that is really gaining a lot of attention right now. Okay. And freedom of speech is dictated by the Constitution and the Supreme Court has laid out what it is. And everybody has freedom of speech. But right now we have this tone in society, everybody has freedom of speech unless I don't like your speech. And now you no longer have freedom of speech. And that's not how it works. We may not like the speech, okay? We may not like it, but it's still freedom of speech. And we have to understand that. And so I think a broader understanding of people's feelings and, and why certain things are offensive to them. And when we start to understand why those things become offensive in like workplaces and stuff like that, we can start work at, be working on that uh, systemic issues that exist. And when we talk about systemic issues, I think that's the other thing is some people think that, okay, we're gonna do this today and we wake up tomorrow and it's gone. That's not gonna happen. You know, it's gonna take some time and, and you know, some people don't like the pace in which it moves or whatever, but unfortunately, again, that's kind of kind of what we got. Um, so um, let me ask you, um, last, last week, there were two rallies uh, in front of um, uh, Municipal Auditorium, TPAC. Um, one was a Black Lives Matter, uh, and one was a um, Blue Lives Matter. Um, and so explain to uh, what's your opinion about why these are two separate discussions. Well, I think they're two separate discussions because there's two um, separate agendas. And by that, um, you have one side that would like to see an overhaul of uh, the judicial system and law enforcement practices and how those are done. Um, then you have another side that feels that by doing that, that it's attack on law enforcement. And by doing those things, you're, you're making police unsafe. And so um, they're two separate conversations because um, the parties have two separate agendas that don't align with each other. Now, can they come together in conversation with the right people and work towards a common goal? I think that's possible, um, but it also takes people to um, give and take, shall we say. And, you know, the kind of the part of the deal is that, um, you know, I'm willing to, okay, maybe give up this idea if you give up that idea so we can come together and talk about a positive direction. Um, you know, police reform is one of those things that happens all the time, okay? Um, the unfortunate an incidents that happened in Minneapolis, when those things happen, the outcry re for reform comes larger and demand to do it more quickly. But law enforcement as a whole is a very adaptive career field, okay? And it changes all the time. There's reform that goes on all the time, okay? It may not be legal reform or what have you, but reform is something that takes place all the time. In essence, it's called change. <laughs> and so um, when, when we talk about two separate sides, I, and I hate, I hate that idea that we have two separate sides, you know. Uh, I would like to have us have a a community where we can come together, we can talk, if there's an issue, we can work through those issues, make positive changes and, and whatever those changes may be. Um, you know, and, and 
um, I, I think we can get there. Like I said, it's just, it's, um, and, and, you know, I'm not saying one side's wrong or, or one song's right. It's just, we have very different opinions as to uh, what we want to see happen. Um, and I think the other thing, you know, in Topeka Midwest, we're different than Portland, Oregon, or Seattle, Washington, okay? We're, we're different than New York City, and we're different in Atlanta. In the Midwest, we just have a little bit different uh, temperament, I think, that leads to the ability of us being able to communicate, talk, and all those other things. Um, and, I'm, and I'm hoping that we're not losing that. I'm hoping that we can, we can get that, you know, brought together, have people come to the table and have conversations and, and uh, come up with ideas that are productive that move things forward. So how do you, um, how do, you do you see the potential of a citizen's review board um, creating a space for that conversation in the future? Well, I think we have a lot of things in place that already do that now. You know, we have the SPCP, I have a Citizens Advisory Council, um, you know, the Center for Peace and Justice. There's a lot of entities out there that are doing that. The Citizen Review Board, really the concept that people are driving is that there's oversight over the police department, not so much engaging in conversation. Um, but one of the things that, there's a lot of people that have talk and have conversations. Um, but what I like to see is when you have talking conversations that then you have ideas that you can work on, move forward and try to improve things. Um, I know Dennis, <laughs> years ago when we were starting the CIT program, there were a lot of different opinions, wasn't there? And, uh, you know, we, we brought parties together and sat down and, uh, you know, and then, and now you see where we're at. And a lot of good, productive things for the citizens of Pika came out of that. And I don't see why we can't do that in these particular uh, times. So um, I, I want to ask you a little bit more about the, um, the uh, anti-bias training that the police department delivers, uh, both at the academy the, for new officers and on an ongoing basis. Um, who delivers that training and how is it developed? Um, you know, and frankly, um, Chief Cochran, I'm going to just share with you that um, my stepmother lives in Arkansas. She lives in a county um, that just this week, uh, and it's only Tuesday, um, the sheriff's department, the sheriff in her county was forced to resign uh, because his estranged wife. Um, recorded this uh, repugnant racist rant um, and it came into the public sphere and uh, he had been an elected sheriff for uh, a, a long time uh, so um, and so he had been through lots of anti-bias training so how could how is that delivered now and um, who develops it and what kind of improvements could be made on that? Well, I think the important thing first you got to start with is um, uh, it, it's in the heart. OK, if you don't feel it and you don't believe it, it doesn't matter what I train you to do, whatever tricks I teach you. It, it at some point, the real person is going to come out. And so when you talk about whatever training it is, whatever you want to do, um, if the person doesn't really believe it, I can sit through hours and hours and hours of training, okay? <laughs> but if I don't buy into it, I don't believe it, I don't feel it, then I've just sat through a whole bunch of training, okay? And so that's one of the things that I tell people over and over and over again is when something happens, misconduct or whatever, there is still the human element, okay? I can teach you, train you, educate you, show you the right way, but at some point, human element comes into play, and people do things for whatever reason because they're humans. So with that being said, 
what we do, uh, we use a variety of different uh, approaches, okay? Um, our training sergeant, Ruben Salamaca, uh, is trained in uh, uh, bias-based policing, uh, education techniques and training, uh, develops a, a curriculum and all that other stuff of his own, um, you know? And so that's one source. We use outside instructors. Um, I believe it's very important that we hear um, from people in our community. Uh, one of the things we do in our academy, we have a forum where we bring in several people from our community um, that have had experiences with law enforcement and explain to the young recruit officers why, why this situation went south or how it went south and why um, it, they felt that it was derogatory or whatever. Uh, I believe that's very important to hear from those aspects. And then we also use outside sources um, that I don't, I don't look for, um, when I say outside sources, I don't look for it to come from uh, other police venues or police officers. I look for uh, civilian citizens that may have training firms and stuff like that uh, because they come in with a different approach than somebody from law enforcement to come into it. So we use a wide uh, spectrum of instructors, views, and, and ideas. Um, let's see, the, the, another question that we have is um, about the progress that's being made about Citizen Review Board. Uh, can you tell us the status of, um, has an ordinance been introduced to create a Citizens Review Board? Well, the Citizen Review Board is one of, like I said, it's one of those conversations that's ongoing. Um, you know, there's, there's not been, uh, shall we say, formal uh, getting together to say, hey, are we going to do this or look at it? Uh, but it's an ongoing conversation. There's a lot of that conversation going on. And, um, you know, at, at, at some point, you know, this, the governing body may say, hey, we're going to uh, you know, form a committee or whatever, look at this or what have you. So uh, I think, you know, citizens, if they want a citizen review board, I think it's important that they, you know, contact their council members and express whether they're in favor of it or not in favor of it and, and why they're in favor of it and why they're not in favor of it. Um, so I'm, I'm afraid this is going to need to be our last question here. Um, and it's a little complicated, but um, it, it appears to one of our participants that individuals or groups who are counter protesting Black Lives Matter peaceful protests have co opted the Bat the Blue and police support flags. Um, and I think this really speaks to um, the issue of outside groups or um, individuals who choose to open carry. Um, in these protests. Um, can you speak to that issue? Um, well, I, I, don't um, I don't know necessarily if it's fair to blanket, you know, the Blue Lives Matter, uh, carrying guns at, at rallies and stuff. One of the things that we have been dealing with um, since COVID has, has really come into play, there's been several rallies at the State House, you know, Going to unmask Kansas and, and different um, rallies like that. The thing about Kansas is Kansas is an open carry state. So you can carry a gun. Any one of you right now can put a gun on your hip and walk down the street and there's nothing that law enforcement can do about it. Okay. That's your right in the state of Kansas. And so when they people go to these rallies, some people continue that mindset that, hey, I carry a weapon, I'm going to carry a weapon. And so you know, when we talk about, um, you know, when you look at some of the rallies we had leading up to, um, you know, a couple of weeks ago, um, you know, rallies that supported Black Lives Matter and stuff like that, some of those events were hijacked by other people um, taking advantage of the situation that weren't on the, that were on that side of the fence, shall we say, but hijacked the opportunities and the movement and stuff like that um, to make BLM look bad in certain situations. 
um, not to make them look bad, but they make them look bad because of what they do. On the flip side of that, uh, you, have, you have some of the same things that are going on, you know, in Back to Blue. You have some individuals that have uh, radical views, radical opinions, and, and, uh, and so sometimes those, uh, when those extremes come into contact with each other, you have negative consequences. And the hopes are that we can, you know, mitigate and manage those. You know, one of the things that um, if you saw on the news, uh, myself and some of my officers was accused of, of um, you know, sheltering and giving aid to Black Lives Matter during the Blue Lives Matter event. Well, what was going on there was we were trying to make sure things were separated so things didn't become uncomfortable. And so what looked like escorting was really trying to get them over to where the majority of their group was located. And it wasn't the idea of escorting them and taking them through, um, you know, the, the thing that was already set up. It was, okay, how do we, how do we get them from one side to the other? Because they're going to get there one way or the other. But if we can make it so it's peaceful and taking them over there and there's no danger or harm to anybody, that was the efforts behind that. And so some of that got construed that we were given aid and comfort and, and uh, loyalty and, and stuff like that when really it was us trying to manage things the best way we could to keep everybody safe. And at the time, at that situation, that seemed like the right thing to do. Yeah. Um, so that's unfortunately all the, all the time that we have today with Chief Cochran. Um, and, and with your permission, Chief, I'm going to save the chat box questions. Uh, and perhaps the league can work with you towards answering these questions and we can deliver that in some kind of a format. Um, yeah. So, um, Lisa, yeah, if you want to, if, if you want to email them, uh, we can work on answers for you. Okay. All right. Um, I, uh, Lisa Staley from the library has an announcement to make. Um, Lisa, I'm not sure how to get you back here. Thank you, Chief. Um, I was just going to say that the library has been convening deliberative conversations on big uh, community and national issues. And the next one that we're going to work on is convening conversations on a new issue guide that's title is policing. What should we do to ensure equal justice and fair treatment in our communities? And um, it, it is designed, these conversations are designed to get beyond the right and wrong and or two separate oppositionals and instead frame the entire issue um, with three options, each valuing either freedom or safety or fairness. Um, and each action is framed with a trade-off or an unintended consequence. Um, I've been facilitating these in our community now for two years. Um, this is um, a really great way to hear other people's experiences and to hear them in a way and to contribute your own in a way where um, you deliberate what you would be willing to accept to find common ground for action. Um, so I will make sure, um, or I will ask Vicki to share out with the league and certainly anyone else who attended today, it's a topic of interest for you. Um, and I hope you would be willing to participate as well. Absolutely, great. Thank you, Alyssa. Um, so uh, please join us uh, on Tuesday, October the 6th when uh, we've had a little bit of change in programming, but we're going to hear from Shawnee County Election Commissioner Andrew Howell before the general election. So we'll see everyone in October. Thank you very much for attending Tuesday Topics.